moving right along, from there we get to the image NT headers. And so this is a structure where there's actually two structures embedded in it. There's a signature, which will have, again, a well-known value. It'll have PE in there, basically. And then there's a file header, which we'll talk about next, which is embedded in the structure. It's not pointed to, but it's actually embedded. So we'll show that structure next. And then there's the optional header, which, again, is embedded into this structure. So it's basically signature, then the next structure immediately after, and then the next structure immediately after that. So here, oh, okay, so that's, we care about all of those fields basically in this case. So starting out, the signature is the first one we care about. It'll be in big Indian order, it'll be 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, 5, uh, 5, 0, which is PE, so the, the P is the 50 and the 45 is the E, right? So it's little Indian, you flip it around. Um, yes. All right, so right from there, now this one, again, is not pointed to, but it's actually embedded in there. So this is the first one. Um, and so I should say that you know the first round of our game is basically going to be going over DOS headers and file headers. So just this information is all we're going to cover in the first round of our game. The DOS header, like we said, two things you care about, signature and the pointer to the next header. And this one, there's more stuff we care about. So there's a machine type. There's a number of sections, time, date, stamp, characteristics. These things right here, we don't really care about that much. All right, so machine. This is one of the things I forgot to put in the previous class, and so people were getting questions on this, and they weren't knowing what the answers were. Machine basically is trying to say uh, what kind of architecture this is meant to be running on in terms of, um, in terms of like assembly language, like what sort of CPU is this supposed to be running on? All right, so, but also this actually, because there's different machine types for 32 and 64 bit x86, uh, this gives us our first indication whether this is a 32 or 64 bit binary. It doesn't have to necessarily be accurate, but this gives us our first kind of view. So if the value is 14C, then this is going to be an x86 binary, or it will most likely be you know 32 bit x86. And a 32-bit x86, or sorry, 32-bit binary we would typically call P32. Funny thing is then 64-bit binaries, they call instead of P64, they call it PE32+. plus. So later on when you get questions about is it 32 or 64-bit, you know, if I say 32 64-bit, 32 means this, 64 means this, 32 means this, 64 means that. All right, so x8664, that one at least sort of makes sense, right? You're saying this is the machine value for x8664. And so this is something which I've come to memorize by virtue of playing my own game. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had this memorized before. Is it P32 plus because it's meant to be extensible beyond 64? Or um, I'm not really sure why they called it P32 plus because it actually does break backwards compatibility with 32-bit. Like the there's there's a location where some of it, they like combine two 32-bit fields to add a new 64-bit, and the offset to other things changes. So, it, uh, it like that's why PEView, for instance, can't parse the 64-bit things because it's just different enough that it breaks parsing basically. All right. So this again, machine field in the file header is the first thing that gives us some indication of 32 or 64-bit. But well, what it's really trying to say, just to be clear, is that this is more sort of what the architecture is that it's supposed to be running on. All right, time date stamp is, as I said before, a pretty interesting one. And it is a typical Unix seconds since epoch. So epoch is January 1st, 1970. And it's saying, you know, how many seconds have elapsed since 1970, basically. And so based on this, you can figure out, you know, when it was actually, what time it's referring to. And the interesting thing is this is set at length time. So whenever someone compiles and links a given binary, it adds in this time date stamp field. And the time date stamp field will basically say, like, this person compiled this file at this time. And it's built in right there in the headers. Um, it's actually has been used for sort of, um, what's the right word? Not malware forensics. I guess malware forensics is about the closest word I can think of. That's right. I think if I had another one, yeah. So, so there was an example talk back at uh, Black Hat Las Vegas 2010, where the slides are still not posted, but we have the videos internally if you want to go watch that. 
um, where he was saying, like, here's all these different sort of chunks of the P file format that kind of help indicate, you know, whether when an attacker has compiled something, you know, what the compiled directory was and things like that. Kind of, you know, building up some, uh, some. He was talking about attribution, but you know, it's it's the sort of circumstantial attribution where if, if an attacker is, you know, not aware of these sort of things, then they're just going to do the same thing and they're not realizing that they're leaving behind this evidence. So, so time date stamp is a big one because it will say, you know, when this file was compiled, and you know, it's been used subsequently for things like tracking the Stuxnet infections and stuff like that. They said, well, we found this binary, and we searched back through our corpus, and we found, oh, it turns out that something with that exact same byte sequences were found, and that had a compile time of, you know, 2009 or whatever. So it can be used for sort of retrospective analysis. You know, the attackers that care will then actually change this. There's like a Kaspersky article where they're showing, hey, the, uh, the Stuxnet group is now changing their time date stamp right here in the file header, but they're not actually changing the time date stamp in some subsequent headers that are deeper embedded in the system. So attackers can, you know, the more the attackers know, the better they can, you know, lie about the information. But uh, it seems like, you know, first of all, most attackers aren't caring enough to actually manipulate these fields, or, you know, basically because they probably don't know about it. So, all right, so that's time date stamp. We'll see, you know, P, U interpreting that later. Next thing we care about in the file header is number of sections. And later on, there's going to be an array of these section headers. And so sections are these things like dot, dot text that'll you know, contain code. There'll be an array of section headers. And up here at the file header level, this is what's telling the OS loader how many of those section headers there are immediately following, uh, immediately following this optional header layer. So that matters. That that's right there. That's that array of section headers that is tacked right after the uh, MT header. Third field we care about in the file header is characteristics. So there'll actually be a bunch of different characteristic things, and it'll be kind of hard to keep track of what's where. But um, <clears throat> some of the characteristics we care about here, and actually I still need to have not updated this slide because there'll be some that I ask you about that part here. Then later. Yeah. All right, so some of the characteristics are things like saying, you know, this is an executable image. You have to have this on a, you know, DLL and an EXE, but you don't necessarily have to have that on an object file that's spit out by the compiler, right? Um, oh, yeah, and this is, uh, this is broken as well. My T he keys are trying to point to their typos where they, that should be typed right there, X turn, uh, no. They have typos in their winnt.h, which has got to have been there for, like, forever, but nobody's ever, I don't know, fixed it up. Anyways. That should be pointing somewhere else, anyways. Um, things we care about are like image file large address where. This is basically saying whether or not this particular binary can handle being loaded, um, or whether it can actually handle, well, it says handle greater than uh, two gigabyte address, but. I'm trying to think of whether I misdescribed that in the previous class or not, or whether I'm going to misdescribe it here. What I'll say is, uh, I believe that field actually is used for indicating whether or not this file can handle. I may be thinking of the characteristics later, but I'll just say the same. I believe this is used for whether or not that uh, binary can handle being loaded into memory at addresses greater than um, two gigabytes or four gigabytes. Basically, for when you have uh, 64-bit binaries, you know, the operating system can load things above four gigabyte range, and uh, therefore, if a binary is not compiled, recognizing that it can be loaded above that four gigabyte range, they can break because they're using, you know, if they have assumptions about what pointers should look like and things like that, then they'll uh, they'll break basically. So, I have a feeling I'm misdescribing that though, but I'll fix it later. I can fix the video. That's the best part. I just go in the video and I say, no, nope, that's what it actually is. There, good. All right. Um, image 32-bit machine. This, again, is just trying to say that uh, this is supposed to run on a 32-bit system. And that's not ever used, this um, file system, this like system file basically is never used on 
that's this file, so I never actually see that set anywhere. But uh, file DLL is definitely one we care about. This one has to be set if it's going to be used as a DLL. You can't unset that flag on a DLL and it fails to work anymore. So the OS loader is definitely checking that, for instance. All right, and this is just, um, this is a field we don't officially care about as far as the class is concerned, but just to give you an idea, um, size of optional header, later on I said there's a file header and then there's an optional header. That optional header could theoretically be expanded or contracted, um, and certainly uh, after this class you'll be able to go and see people's interesting manipulations that they do with PE files where they do things like that. But um, for our purposes it will basically always be set to a fixed value, but people who want to you know, mess with the binaries and mess with uh, what's actually happening can change up the size. And these are just old debugging forms. 